Hi, good morning, um, and welcome to our webinar um, series. Uh, we're just doing, um, just waiting for some more people to to just um, register with us. We have um, we have fifty three registered today, um, which is um, which is nice. So um, I would just like to do a little bit of housekeeping um, as we um, as we go along in the, the introduction. So, firstly, um, we would really like to know where you're um, where you're from and where you're calling in from um, today. Um, it would be interested to know your uh, your job role and an organisation um, too. So if you wouldn't mind just um, dropping that in the um, in the chat at the bottom right, that would be um, that would be wonderful. Um, if you have any any questions um, today as the as the presentation um, goes on, then there's a tab at the bottom. Ask a question. Fairly um, fairly straightforward. If you could pop it in there, um, and then we'll um, address as many of the questions as possible. Um, at the end of the, the presentation um, today, uh, so I think we can um, we can start um, the the presentation. Uh, the best um, browser to use um, will be um, Chrome. We find um, it's um, best with um, with the Crowdcast um, system. And where you registered um, today, um, it does show you. Um, if you go back to to that link, it will show you the the future um, events. Um, please feel free to to look at that. Um, what's coming up, um, but also if you if you scroll down, there are recordings of our um, our previous events, um, which may also be um, be useful um, for you. So um, today we have um, part of our environments for the future um, series, and this is about designing um, a truly inclusive um, play space. Um, just really to introduce my uh, myself um, for those that, that don't know me, uh, I'm Michael Honigman. I'm the managing director and owner uh, of Jupiter Play. Uh, and yeah, I've been in the business um, quite some time, um, almost um, almost thirty um, thirty years um, now. Uh, and I'd like to think I'm still as passionate about delivering um, really great play spaces as I was when I entered this um, this industry. Hi everyone, I'm Rosie. I am creative lead at Jupiter Play. I've been with the business around seven years now. I joined the business straight out of university um, and had a really, really amazing career at the company so far, um, doing a variety of things, actually starting out in the design team to begin with, designing lots of amazing spaces um and seeing them come from concept to to delivery and kids playing on them which is really really rewarding um and now i'm taking on a role where i'm looking at um some kind of key projects um and pushing ourselves into um new spaces which is really exciting Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Yoss. I'm part of the design team here at Jupiter Play. Um, I'm actually coming up to my first year in the play industry, um, so I'm still relatively new to the industry. But prior to that, I worked uh, in kind of quite a few different settings. Um, the one before that was uh, working with neurodiverse children in a primary school setting, which was um, well a lot of relevant experience to what we're going to be talking about today. And then even before that, I worked with a visual impairment charity designing for early year settings and uh, developing um, kind of a, a resource pack in collaboration with um, yeah, a visual impairment charity, working with visually impaired people of all ages. Um, and yeah, that's kind of my, my experience. Excellent. Thanks, um, Rosie um, and, and Jos. Um, so a little bit about the um, the company. Um, we're an independent, um, family-run uh, company. Um, we really uh, like to do a collaborative approach. We like to work with people, uh, and we think that that's the the best way to deliver um, great um, play spaces. Um, we like to challenge um, the norms um, a little bit. Um, well, actually, quite a lot. Um, and we really think that um, the current processes of um, delivering playgrounds could be um, could be better. Um, we don't think that anything of any real value can be delivered in four to six weeks um, design time. Um, so um, we'd like to we'd like to challenge that, and we'd like to think that we can offer a more collaborative um, approach to designing great um, play spaces um, and unique um, play spaces. 
Um, we live by um, five key values, um, creativity, trust, commitment, passion, which I've mentioned um, before, um, and high quality. We always work on the, um, the high quality um, end of the, the marketplace. And we're different um, to um, other companies in, um, in our industry. And what makes us different is that we don't manufacture um, anything. Uh, we have a, a global partner um, program. We work with a number of different suppliers um, who really, uh, we believe, can offer something different to both us and to, um, and to our clients. Um, they have different, um, different strengths, and it means that every project that, that we deliver can be um, unique um, and can be special, um, and that's what we, uh, we try and achieve um, today. Um, inclusive play is um, we're really passionate about in, inclusive play, uh, and actually um, I set up a business called Inclusive Play back in um, 2005, uh, and this was really in response to the Disability Discrimination Act uh, coming into the the UK, and having discussions with our supply chain uh, at that time. And at that time, no one was interested in developing products uh, for. Um, children with uh, with special needs. It was it was too niche. It wasn't mainstream. Um, it was a lot of in, investment, um, and so um, I decided that we could do that um, ourselves. So I set up an inclusive play, uh, and actually that was a real issue for us. It was a real problem, and it almost uh, took Jupiter Play under because we financed um, the, the the business, and we never got anything to to market in the first um, two or three two years. We had a lot of investment time. Um, and a lot of creative um, ideas, um, but we couldn't get the products to, to market. So we decided to, um, to cut our losses a little bit and start to look at some of the playground staples. Um, things like um, Flush Level Roundabout was the first um, one in the marketplace, um, looking at um, the spinning bowls and how that they could be easily accessible with just cutting a, um, a simple area out of the front. So that's really how the, um, this started. Um, but inclusive play is much more than about product. Um, really, it's about um, having a process. Um, and the PIPA um, was developed to um, plan inclusive play areas as a, a methodology um, of finding out if your, your playground is, um, is accessible, um, is inclusive um, or not, and what are the areas that are, that are missing. Um, and also, there's a PIPA map. Uh, and that's there um, really to help families of disabled children if they're um, moving around, if they're visiting someone, to find their local um, play space. Um, so it's much more than, than product. It's really about a, um, a movement, and that's quite exciting, really. So what are we going to um, learn to, today? What are we going to look at? So um, it goes much deeper um, than just thinking about um, children with, um, with disabilities. We're going to look at that. Um, but we're going to look at um, genders, we're going to look at different age groups um, and different backgrounds um, through our presentation um, today. So I hope you find it um, interesting. Um, and please, as I say, if you have any questions, please um, pop them into the, um, the box um, below and we'll try and address them um, towards the end. So firstly, um, what, you know, what is it, um, inclusion and how does that relate um, to, um, to play? Um, so as I said um, earlier, inclusive play, we have a, a strong um, strong history um, in looking at that. And this is just a quote that kind of came out, inclusive design um, describes methodologies um, to create products that understand and enable people of all backgrounds and abilities. Inclusive design may address accessibility, age, culture, economic situation, education, gender, geographic location, language, and, and race. Um, so yeah, often when we talk about inclusion, um, we talk about ability. Um, so um, when we're starting to, to look at this much more deeply, um, we're looking at these other areas um, too. But looking at um, abilities as well, and what, is, um, what does an inclusive play, uh, playground look like or what does an inclusive area uh, look like? And this is, I think this is a really great way just to, um, to illustrate um, this. So um, often uh, these things are not even thought about. Um, so you have a, a development, an area, um, which is actually um, exclusive. Um, there might be um, opportunities then think, oh, what have we done? Actually, we need an area. We need an area for, uh, for inclusion. We need an area for um, special needs, um, etc. So we put in an area, but it's not. It out, sits outside um, this area. Or we have a special area and we put it inside. 
um, the area, which is the, the integration. Um, but inclusion really should be, uh, it should be invisible. Um, it should be just part of uh, what we do. And I think that's a really good example of how to, um, how to explain um, these different um, elements. And I think um, some of the interesting things that came out of, um, of COVID um, was the, the real uh, interest that um, people had in the, the local um, green spaces. And it wasn't just the park, it was, uh, I think it was any um, green space and lots of um, places were um, discovered that hadn't been, um, hadn't been used um, before. So everyone was inviting the local green spaces um, more. Um, 57% um, surveyed were more aware of the impact that green space had um, on their um, on their mental health, um, and I think this is um, this is really important for for different sectors, and it's interesting to um, to start to see where you're um, coming from. So could you just go back um, a screen? Just interested to see where you're um, coming from because if we get any house builders um, here, I think this is a um, particularly important um, point in looking at the the quality. Um, of green spaces and play areas within housing developments because buyers are really asking um, now and they're really thinking about um, the quality of the, the green space that's on their, on their doorstep. But this is really important for, um, for disabled um, people who reported that um, COVID really affected their, um, their well-being, almost 60% um, saying that, and also having higher feelings of, of loneliness um, with disabled people and the, the elderly. Um, through there, so there are lots of issues that I suppose we're trying to um, we're trying to cover um, through this pre presentation um, today. And one of the key things to um, to bring this in and to to really be um, inclusive is to to ask. Um, you know, through um, through consultation, I think we can learn um, we can learn a lot, um, and we can reach um, many um, diverse um, areas of the um, of the population. So. Um, I think this is um, this is key, and this should always um, inform the um, the design brief. But I think it's also important that that we go back um, and we consult again. We consult on the draft design. We consult on the detailed um, design just to make sure that we get projects um, right. And this goes back to uh, process that I mentioned at the at the beginning. Really important that we have a strong uh, process for for designing um, playgrounds um, rather than. Um, a quick um, process to get it done um, quickly. So that's um, that's part of the, the challenge. I'm now going to hand you over to um, Jos, who's going to take you through the next part of the um, presentation. Thanks, Michael. Um, so yeah, designing for all abilities, I'm kind of going to cover uh, what Michael alluded to there in designing for disabilities and uh, people with uh, special needs. So 9% of children in the UK have a disability, um, yet there's often a, a misconception that this means a physical disability. In fact, of that group, it's only 15% that have their mobility impaired, whereas um, something more like social and behavioural impairments are much more common, making up nearly 40% of that group. Taking autism as an example, this affects nearly 3 million people in the UK now. Oh, sorry, Rosie. <laughs> um, uh, the way environments are designed uh, hugely impacts how people with autism can navigate their daily lives because they process their surroundings and interactions very differently. Um, this highlights that we need to really be aware that disability isn't always visible. Okay. Uh, if you want to move to the next slide, cheers. So uh, people with learning disabilities are two and a half times more likely to have health problems um, with a high percentage also struggling uh, with mental health issues, often due to their other health issues. Uh, again, this group uh, of people with learning disabilities are 10 times more likely to have serious sight problems, which increases uh, quite significantly with severity uh, for more profound learning disabilities. Every year there's a report commissioned um, and it kind of comes to the same outcome that people with special needs and disabilities are continually at a disadvantage in essentially every aspect of their lives. It's These reports are great highlighting the issue but they're lacking the joined up thinking to push for more change. 
the costs of having a disabled child are triple that of having a cost uh, having a child without a disability. So providing play provisions that are fully inclusive can be really important to aid those families um, rather than always having to rely on community groups, SEN facilities and other such establishments. So here we have the, oh no, you're good. <laughs> um, here we have the uh, wheel of six senses of inclusion. Green spaces and playgrounds should be designed for a variety of user interests and capabilities. Engaging the community in a design process is really important um, as this often highlights small factors that make a big difference to those who have particular health or mobility needs. If in doubt, uh, we recommend using this wheel as it can really um, help you assess, like, uh, like Michael alluded to earlier, um, draft designs kind of assessing that there is an appropriate um, kind of spread of sensors being being uh, stimulated through the through the play space. Um, yeah, making sure that your play space is completely uh, inclusive. So I'm now going to go through each of these sensors uh, individually, kind of explain what they are and uh, how we implement them in in play. So proprioception, this is our ability to sense where our body is in space um, and how it's moving, uh, often in relation to itself. Uh, this sense helps children develop their gross motor skills and coordination. To incorporate proprioception in our play designs, we include activities that require um, balance, such as climbing structures or balancing beams or hand-eye coordination, like the piece of equipment you can see in the bottom right. I've actually got a little fun test if, uh, if people want to get involved. Um, Rosie's going to demonstrate on screen for us. You can see her in the bottom corner. Um, it's just a way of um, kind of very loosely checking your proprioceptive uh, system. So if you close your eyes and stretch your arms out fully in front of you and keeping your eyes closed, try and touch your two index fingers together. Um, there we go. As you can see, I thought Rosie. I wasn't going to do it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you always doubt yourself, don't you? Um, <laughs> so yeah, most people uh, can get this on their first or second attempt, meaning their proprioceptive, proprioceptive system is working just fine. Uh, this isn't a you know be all or end all test. Um, if that's not the case, don't worry about it. But um, it's just a little bit of a little bit of an activity you can take away. Um, the next sense is the vestibular sense. Um, and this is our sense of balance and spatial orientation. It helps us understand movement and the changes in our body position. Um, basically anything with dynamic movement. So spinning, sliding, rocking, turning upside down, moving quickly, rolling, these all stimulate the vestibular sense. This is really important because it promotes sensory integration, um, which again is just hugely important for a child's overall development. The next sense is touch. Uh, touch allows us to explore spaces through tactile sensations and children use this to manipulate objects, differentiate textures and develop fine motor skills. Tactile play promotes cognitive development um, such as cause and effect relationships. So playing with sand, and holding it up and dropping it, you kind of learn the world around you through through that kind of um, tactile experience. Neurodiverse children often um, process these uh, sensory experience in very different ways. And from my experience, they, they respond really positively to highly tactile elements such as sand or water play. Um, often sand is not, not kind of, uh, not really considered in many play spaces because um, there are, you know, kind of preconceptions with with sand in terms of safety aspects. But um, yeah, we we are massive advocates for it, and um, and it's actually often the most risk, risk assessed elements within a playground. So um, we think the benefits massively outweigh the potential risks. Smell is a powerful sense that helps children explore and understand their environment. Children use this sense to recognize 
um, different areas, explore their surroundings, and even identify familiar people and places. Um, it's quite hard to it's quite hard to implement in terms of equipment, but this this kind of uh, is really good in terms of expanding into planting options um, in the surrounding areas. Hearing is essential for children's play as it enables them to communicate with others, hear and recognize different sounds and develop language skills. Then children use their hearing to listen to music, uh, follow directions, communicate with peers during play, which again, all contributes to their social and emotional development. Um, vision is of course, really critical in play as it allows them to navigate their environment, recognize and differentiate colors and shapes um, and follow and interpret visual cues from their playmates. The ability to see clearly also promotes safety during play, allowing children to avoid ob obstacles and hazards. Um, natural light is actually critical for uh, eye development and it's been proven that spending 13 hours a week, so under two hours a day outside um, during your childhood can reduce the likelihood of short-sightedness um, by 50%. Um, so that kind of linking that with um, people who have learning disabilities or more likely to, to develop eyesight issues, this can be a massive way of, you know, stunting that, um, th those issues down the line in their lives. So this next slide actually shows how we use this wheel um, in a draft setting. So this is a layout of a, of a design we did um, within the last year. And essentially just by labeling everywhere um, that one of the sensors is um, kind of stimulated, we're able to make sure that there's a really even spread throughout the area of, um, of all the sensors. And if there are any kind of lacking areas or if there's a massive concentration of one sense in a, a particular area rather than spread through the space, we can tackle this um, and you know, make appropriate adjustments to the design. So taste is obviously one I've not spoken about, but it's a, you know, uh, one of our core, uh, core senses. Um, it's really important for children's play as it helps develop preferences in foods and flavors, um, and they can explore you know, foods from, um, they can explore different foods and also develop their sense of smell um, and also learn about cultures and traditions through food. It's not a typical consideration for play, um, but can definitely be explored in kind of wider projects through community gardens, allotments, shared gardens, uh, cafes potentially. Um, and really, actually, a picnic bench is is allowing that and accommodating for that um, that sense to be to be explored. Again, height isn't a sense, um, but there are vast benefits to playing at varying heights for children. It promotes accessibility, challenge, diversity, social interaction, um, and it really, divides, it really provides children with a range of play opportunities that support physical, cognitive, and social development. Playing at different heights provides diversity in their play experience, um, making it more engaging for all children providing alternative routes that uh, kind of have appropriate levels of challenge um, can really develop physical and cognitive abilities, but also that sense of achievement, you know, getting to the top of a, a unit um, in various different ways can be really, yeah, a real like powerful experience. Um, playing activities such as, um, sorry, Play activities at different heights also encourages that social interaction between children. So if a child is climbing a play structure, they can um, they may need help from a, another child that promotes cooperation and teamwork, which is all kind of um, all really good for their development. The um, disability or well, the, the standards um, under kind of DDA um, state that playing at height is a minimum of 600 millimeters, uh, yeah, 600 millimeters, which isn't actually very high at all. Um, we kind of aim a meter upwards, but majority of our kind of bigger projects, we really, we really push that and 
yeah, kind of aim for the sky. Want to make some huge, uh, huge units to give that real sense of um, that th those real different experiences at completely different heights, um, which is really important, particularly if you are kind of have a mobility issue. For someone in a wheelchair, that can be a that can be a really amazing experience and something that they don't get in their everyday lives. Um, so I'm now going to pass it over to back to Michael to talk uh, about what an inclusive play space looks like. Okay, so what does an inclusive um, play space uh, look like? So we've chosen two hugely different um, projects, actually both um, are large scale projects, but hugely different in their, uh, in their, their feeling, their look, their um, activities um, to, to show um, this. We have um, Harwood's adventurous um, playground on the, um, on the left um, here, which was delivered for um, Watford um, Borough Council um, back in 2017. Uh, and it's been really massively successful and it's been really interesting to, to see how um, this project changes um, and develops uh, through, the, through the different seasons um, and also through the, the years as the planting um, has matured. Um, and we're very proud of uh, Butlin's um, Sky Park, um, which has um, just opened um, this month uh, at Easter. It's been um, two years uh, in, the, in the making and a huge um, part of this. Um, was looking at um, the inclusivity of the um, of the design. So hopefully we're going to take you through um, uh, a video um, of this. It just points out some of the uh, inclusive elements as we as we go through. I understand the sound wasn't coming through on that um, on that video, um, but I think it's got some annotations, and it just really showed the the things to really to um, to think about from the, the you know the accessible pathways, the um, the gradients, um, having um, resting um, points um, with um, within this, uh, and then having a number of different um, elements that that are also um, challenging and and interesting and exciting. Um, and really incorporating these things with, um, within the, um, the design. So lots of really interesting um, components um, there and lots of choice. I think what's really interesting with, um, with Harwoods is every time you, you turn a corner, you've got a decision to make um, which, way you, which way you go, um, whether you stick to the pathway or whether you um, clamber through the, the undergrowth um, in a different, um, a different way. So um, lots of different um, opportunities. Um, to play within that and lots of different senses um, and skills um, to, to be developed. I'm going to look at the um, Sky Park um, video here. So this was a, an incredible um, project uh, to, to work on. 
Um, and it was um, really interesting. The idea that we um, that we had was uh, a playground that was um, that was full of of emotions, um, and so the um, the colours and the the activities um, in each space um, would emote um, a different um, feeling and a different um, emotion um, as people travelled through the um, the play space. Uh, it's the the first time that we have integrated lighting. Um, within a, a playground, and I think that that's um, you know that's really um, interesting um, from a point of view of extending the um, the hours of play, you know, having a different um, feeling, different atmosphere um, throughout the um, throughout the playground at, at different times. Um, many of the items were designed uh, bespokely for um, for the the project. You can see the the swing frame uh, being in the shape of a, a heart. Um, and the idea is that there's the heart line that runs um, that runs through that. Um, it also has an LED strip um, on it that you can control through the giant seesaw and the motion of the um, the seesaw that that controls that. Um, you have a, a slide which uh, lights up, you know, as you go as you go down um, the slide and the and the slide um, and the LED light follows you. Um, but inclusion uh, is included right throughout the. Um, right throughout the design. Um, whilst there's also um, challenge um, for uh, the kids that um, that need it uh, most. So there's um, a massive amount of um, play um, opportunity in, in different ways. And whilst these projects uh, are both totally um, different, uh, I think they, they really highlight uh, the fact that inclusion can be hidden um, within the, the design. It doesn't need to be uh, immediately apparent. Um, that you have an inclusive um, play area. It just needs to be uh, that everyone can play together, no matter their um, ability, their age, um, and their gender. So I'm going to hand over um, now to Rosie, who's going to take you through the, the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's always amazing to see Butlins and it being so fresh. Um, it's just so colourful um, and exciting and I can't wait to, to go and visit it soon. Um, so when we talk about inclusion, um, I think we need to talk about all the groups in our society. Um, in the past, we talk about inclusive play and we talk about um, the younger generation and um, we, we think about play um, and disabilities, both learning and physical. Um, but I think when we talk about inclusion, as I say, we need to think about everyone in our society. Um, and one topic that I'm passionate about is gender inclusive design. Um, this is something that we're talking about a lot at the moment. Um, and it's something that we've discussed in more detail on a previous webinar. So get in touch if you want to learn more about this topic. We're just going to touch on this um, briefly, but there is so much more to learn if you're interested. So it's really important to talk about gender, gender as a topic first before going into, into more detail. So gender and sex are related, um, but they're different from gender identity. Um, it's really important when you talk about inclusion and gender that we're capturing everyone who identifies as a minority um, within um, the area of gender. So throughout this section, we discussed this topic in relation to how girls feel in our public spaces. But we know there are so many other minorities um, who may face similar issues as well. Um, so we just want to make sure that we are encapsulating all those people. So my journey of better understanding around this topic actually started with this book, um, Invisible Women, which was released in 2019, and it exposed the data bias in a world designed for men. So I don't want to turn this into a man bashing at all, but it is a common understanding that the lives of men have been taken to represent human lives overall. So when it comes to the lives of the other half of humanity, there is often nothing but silence. Um, the gender data gap isn't just about silence. These silences, these gaps have consequences. So they impact on women's lives day to day. Um, it's, it's used to kind of represent humans overall. So thinking about the size of mobile phones, the paracetamol dosages um, there's endless examples 
Um, and some of these impacts might be minor, but they all add up. And this just highlights as well that data is super important in order to shed light on areas where progress needs to be made. And I think that's evident for all the topics that we're talking about in this um, presentation. Um, data really provides evidence of what works and it also reveals gaps where further efforts need to be made. Um, statistics that adequately reflect the lived realities of men and women, girls and boys are indispensable tools for developing evidence-based policies and solutions to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment. So it's really shocking to see that only 13% of the world's countries actually dedicate a budget to gender statistics. Um, so I think it's something that really needs working on. So over the past year, we've been involved in some amazing consultation events with groups of teenage girls and we've gained so much insight and we've really started filling those knowledge gaps um, within our company. Um, and amazing charities such as Make Space for Girls and Women in Sport have been conducting research, um, which again is providing us with valuable insight. Um, so what what I'm going to cover now is um, looking at some of the key principles that we see as being a way um, to address the inequalities in our parks and open spaces when it comes to gender. So as you can see, this is at one of the consultation events that I attended. One girl was very adamant that swings should not have an age limit um, and shouldn't just be placed in the toddler area. Um, so I think that message is loud and clear. And we know we know girls love to be social and spend time with their friends in a safe space. So introducing basket type swings or group swings is definitely a must. And it's really high on their list of wants and needs for spaces. And so building on that point of age appropriate equipment is giving this group a space they can use as their own. Um, a space that they can claim and that suits their needs. Teenage provision tends to be muggers, skate parks and BMX tracks, but these really only suit boys. So we need to be thinking about um, things that we can provide and providing more options for the wider teenage audience, thinking about what they do in their spare time and making facilities outdoors that are free that they can access. This project is Cantley Park in Wokingham. Um, it was designed around a series of rooms with different user experiences. Um, and we managed to use some of our interactive play equipment that you might be aware of. Um, and that really kind of marked some of the uses of the areas. Um, but as you can see, it's very much integrated with the rest of the play. Um, the different user experiences they are defined by these rooms but they aren't defined by physical boundaries um the large signature pieces they're bold and they contrast against the surfacing colors so when we were designing this we didn't design this intentionally thinking about gender um but when we attended the opening opening event which michael said was probably the busiest opening event he's ever seen um we noticed just how much the the whole community was mixing and sharing the space um and there were very young children kind of running off into the the teenage area um, and playing on the football wall with the older boys um and the girls were kind of in the toddler area just chilling out on one of the the spinning dishes so that might make a few people nervous but i think when we spoke to parents, they absolutely loved the fact that their their children of different ages could play together and felt comfortable playing together. Um, so I think maybe that different approach to space um, can actually go a long way in almost like leveling the playing field. And these are just some images um, of the opening day. You can see how busy it is. Um, and this play space really um, includes a lot of very unique um, play experiences and on that day we saw girls really claiming spaces such as the large spinning dish 
um, and there's a climbing climbing blocks um, that they were sitting on um, because it was higher up. I think they had that sense of safety um, and they also tagged tagged it. Um, so they wrote their names all over it and really claimed it as their own, um, which is really positive. So another idea we have is um, embracing technology. Teenagers have grown up with technology. We can't escape the fact that it's a huge part of their lives. So let's use that to bring them outdoors. So they're getting the health and well-being benefits of being in nature, but they're using things that they use in their everyday lives. This is the, the phono you can see on the screen, which is an interactive DJ booth. Um, it's been a huge success with up to eight hours of use per day during the school holidays. So it really gets adopted um, in spaces. You can play music from your mobile phone um, and have all the functionality of a DJ deck. Um, it's very in depth. Um, so it's great for creatives um, and it really allows people to really embrace themselves, uh, express themselves. Sorry. And space to just be. Um, we know teenagers like hanging out, chatting, um, and I think having different heights helps them feel safe. So we believe we can be much more creative with our seating options and really facilitate much more social seating areas, which really foster that sense of community. I really like these massive tables, these community tables um, that are kind of on that super size scale. Um, and you can definitely see kind of parties being thrown uh, like street parties, but around these these big pieces of furniture um, that are free to use. Um, and finally, visibility. Um, you saw a little glimpse of it with the, the Butlins project. That's the first time we kind of delved into the realm of lighting um, integrated with play and it's it's gone really really well it looks incredible it's so exciting it's so new um and this is really an area that we're working hard to develop more um lighting can really bring products to life um it can extend the use um of the play space um it can help with security and feeling safe um, there are many of our products which have integrated lighting and we're developing this further, um, but it's also thinking about how the landscape can be lit in a way that's soft, playful and inviting and doesn't promote antisocial behaviour. So moving on um, to another area, um, I think when we were talking about designing gender inclusive spaces, we focused on making appropriate space and improving a sense of safety. And I think this is also relevant to this group when we think about designing for our aging population. Um, and we definitely need to focus on um, safety and space um, and claiming space if we're to design a truly inclusive play space. Um, I don't think the fact that our ageing population is growing will be news to anyone, but I can't believe that the number of people aged 65 and over increased by 23% between 2009 and 2019 at a time when the whole UK population only increased by 7% um, and it's only going to keep growing. So this is an area of the population that we really need to cater for. And I think um, when we talk about the NHS um, and the issues that that's facing, um, there's a real rise in social prescribing um, and doctors prescribing the use of public spaces to aid in the relief of some ailments that our old, older generations may be, may be dealing with. And I think um, we need to think carefully about how our spaces can work harder to really facilitate that. So being physically active throughout your life is, is so important and it leads to a whole range of benefits such as um, better test scores at school, um, for children, it improves your mental well-being and it lowers the risk of health concerns. 
um, we we really see that adults and the older generation are the role models of a of our younger generation. So if we can ensure that all adults can be active throughout their lives as they age, um, this will really inspire our younger generations to lead healthier lives. Um, and then that then means our adults and older people are healthier before they start aging and they will age healthier. Um, so we're kind of slowly and continually improving that, that issue. So I think it's obvious that visiting parks and open spaces um, is, is good for everyone and it's been proven to bring a huge range of benefits to our ageing population. So physically it provides a destination to walk to, so that's getting their joints and muscles moving and it also provides that gentle cardiovascular exercise which is so good for you. Um, but importantly, I think it provides a relaxing space um, for these people to spend time with their friends and family. And it also allows people who may feel isolated or be isolated to meet new people. Um, so, yeah, just having that space will benefit them massively. So parks are there for everyone to use and I don't think any design interventions are needed for a space to become a destination to walk to. But like when we talk about designing to include all genders, designing for all ages and particularly our older generations, we need to be providing and making spaces specifically for their needs. So our partners lap set have a wonderful range of senior fitness equipment which we just have a little video to highlight here So I think we have solutions to get our ageing population physically active in a traditional sense. And we know that this can benefit them physically and mentally. Um, but what we're excited about is our interactive range of equipment through LAPSET, um, another, another area that they um, supply to us. And particularly the sonar arch, um, which you can see here, that facilitates dancing. So this case study shows how 10 senior care homes in the Netherlands have used Sonar Arch to get their residents outdoors, exercising by dancing and having fun listening to music with their families. The music, the sounds and the instructions, they really trigger the passive elderly in particular to become physically revitalised and mentally alert. So this is particularly beneficial to people with dementia um, and we actually have some white papers written on this, um, which just show how, show the evidence of how this is benefiting um, dementia patients. If you're interested, I think it's a really interesting idea to have um, something like this, the sonar arch, in a care setting. Um, and yeah, we're happy to discuss that if that's something that um, you'd like to look into further. So we've talked about making space for these groups, but I think we can also think about creating spaces that work for everyone and bring all ages together. 
we've seen how the more time young and old people spend together, the more it benefits both parties. And studies have found that interaction with young children can decrease older people's loneliness, delay mental decline, and even reduce the risk of disease or death. So when we were looking at um, the Cantley Park um, example, that play space where we designed rooms, but we didn't think about um, age barriers or physically um, kind of defining areas by age, everyone came together. Um, so I think what we see in the future is designing spaces that work hard for everyone and brings everyone together, because ultimately that's going to benefit all parties. So finally, the last area that we want to talk about is designing for all backgrounds. Um, and this is something that we are just kind of delving into at the moment. And it's something we know we need to be very sensitive with um, and it's something that we need to educate ourselves on much more um, and as Michael was talking about at the beginning of the presentation when we were when we were looking at the effects of Covid and how um, there was a heightened appreciation for green spaces it also highlighted how there was such an unequal access to good quality open spaces and looking into that into much more detail, um, we noticed that people of colour are more likely to live in urban are areas with a deficiency of access to green spaces. That was defined by um, the London plan in terms of how far households need to travel to access a space, but also its quality and size. And I think when we're so passionate about providing good quality spaces for everyone, um, the fact that there is a whole area of our society that is not having access to these spaces, we really want to make a difference. Um, but we know we need to learn so much more um, about that so that we can make sure that we're providing the right solutions. When we were looking at um, this area and doing a bit of research, we discovered this really interesting research paper by Dr. Bridget Snaith called Weeds, Wildflowers and White Privilege. Um, and I think it really looks into so much detail around this topic. Um, and I think I've just pulled out some really interesting insight and suggestions about how we can start tackling that inequality. Um, I think having that empathy and valuing difference um, so that we're not pushing our own views um, and our own agendas is really important. I think also professionals need to be aware of their privilege, um, their training and their influence and making sure that they're using that to benefit and represent everybody. Understanding the issues for specific groups, especially those who may have or are experiencing discrimination. So really understanding what people are experiencing in their area. Um, don't just consult with people already in the park. Go to where you know people congregate. And I think um, we found that schools are a really good way to engage whole communities um, and find the people that maybe aren't using those spaces at present, but um, need to and want to in the future and learning how we can make that happen. Collaborative design, um, it's an emerging practice, um, which is focused on making sure community voices are heard. But it's something that we have been doing for a very long time. We're very invested in um, kind of getting involved with the right stakeholders, working as a larger design team. Um, and we really find that that leads to the most successful spaces um, because it, it facilitates what the wider community being represented much more. And also, I think what we would we would always advocate is that children's play is a great leveler that brings families from all backgrounds together. I think everyone with a child um, can appreciate how difficult it is um, and it really helps um, pull people together through um, those empathetic feelings. So I'm just going to bring Yoss in here who has been doing a little bit of research as I said um, and has found some amazing examples um, where yeah, different cultures have been represented through play spaces. 
Thanks, Rosie. Yeah, um, we've got three little examples here, and I think they really show how that community-led design and consultation is really important in three quite contrasting ways. So this first one is a um, playground designed by London-based nonprofit Catholic Action, and uh, it's for a school in Lebanon. Um, and the whole school was actually set up to cater for children who fled their homes in Syria. They used, they worked with those children uh, to understand their needs and playing preferences um, and found that actually it wasn't just a play space they were after. They wanted a place to relax with their friends. Um, a really nice uh, addition to this design is that the whole, the whole design is modular um, and can be really easily assembled and disassembled to, if, if it ever needs transporting, um, which I think is a really nice kind of extra addition. Um, the next one is a regeneration project in, now my uh, my pronunciation may be very bad here, so apologies, but Care for Felus in Haiti, um, under a program called Lamica, which in Haitian Creole means a better life in my neighborhood. Um, basically, the, the whole area was decimated by the uh, 2010 earthquake. Um, and in order to kind of reflect the local community, um, local artists, families, children, all got an opportunity to design um, like on a local mural to really make it their own. Um, and again, it's just shown how that collaboration is really key to make to make a space part of the community. And this last one is an example from Copenhagen. Um, uh, the architecture firm Big wanted to uh, kind of pull away from the classic uh, Danish design um, and found out there were actually like 60 um, kind of nationalities represented and living in the area. Um, so they they literally wanted to take a piece of everyone's nationality and kind of combine it through this huge um, huge regeneration pro uh, kind of space. Um, so it included uh, Jamaican sound systems, Argentinian barbecues, Japanese octopus playgrounds, Norwegian bike racks, Moroccan fountains, Brazilian bar chains underneath Chinese palm trees, Thai boxing ring, uh, a slide from Chernobyl and um, an Indian climbing play area, just to just to name a few. Um, it's it's a huge, huge site and um, it's definitely, definitely uh, worth a look at if, if you're interested. Um, I think all three projects are quite different in how they've gone, around, uh, gone about that community consultation. Um, there isn't a right or wrong, uh, but we think, yeah, just getting that community as involved with these projects is, is really important and uh, can obviously lead to some amazing things. That was so interesting, Yoss. Thank you. And we're just going to leave it up to Michael to summarise. <laughs> Yeah, so um, thank you, um, thank you both, uh, and I think um, really, hopefully, you've um, you've taken something out of um, of today's uh, presentation, and you know you've um, you've all learned um, something today. I certainly um, I certainly have, and um, I'd like to uh, thank um, Rosie and Yoss for the input and the the research that they've done um, on on this topic, uh, because we talk a lot about this topic, uh, but we talk uh, about it from an inclusive play point of view as far as um, abilities um, are concerned. So we wanted really to, to try and widen um, our, our scope and so uh, appreciate the, the work that you've done um, there. Um, so yeah, we have a number of um, learning outcomes and I think the, the key thing to, to think about is the, the, the collaborative um, approach and, uh, and reaching out, um, really important. We've talked about avoiding um, tokenism and often uh, we see uh, a, a playground design brief and it asks for um, a basket swing um, and a flush level um, roundabout uh, on schemes. And I think this is, you know, it's important that every playground has um, some, some intervention, um, some um, inclusive um, opportunities, but it's also really important to, to deliver in each area a really truly inclusive destination um, space. Uh, because these are the kids um, that that really uh, that really need um, great spaces, and they don't have um, a lot of opportunity 
Um, so I think we need to to make that happen. And I think we need to have make that happen with partners that that understand um, what they're um, what they're doing. So uh, I think if you've enjoyed what we've done today, then please um, reach out um, to us because um, these wonderful spaces um, don't happen in a four to six week um, process. Um, they really have to take um, nine months to to a year, sometimes more. Um, to to deliver um, a great um, play space. Um, so yeah, as I say, I hope you've um, you've enjoyed um, today. We have um, time now for um, for some questions. If you uh, have any questions, then either put them into the chat or um, ask any questions. I see it's empty um, at the um, at the moment. So um, so if you have a question, then please um, please put that in. And um, in the meantime, um, we'll. And talk about you know what's um, what's next. So we'd really um, enjoy meeting your teams, um, and we're very happy to to do uh, presentations to to your teams to um, understand any of the the topics um, that we um, that we talk about through our um, our webinar um, series. Um, please do follow us um, on on social media. Um, we're um, very active on LinkedIn, um, in in particular. Um, and Instagram, you can see a lot of our um, our work um, there. Um, but you can also follow us on the the Crowdcast uh, website, which means you'll be the first to to know uh, about any of our future um, future events. Um, there's still um, there's still no questions as um, as such coming. So maybe we maybe we answered um, everything um, there. Um, and I just think um, I'd like to to finish with a particular um, mention to um, to Jos um, today, who this is his first um, webinar um, that he's been in, um, involved with, and it's always um, really nice to to see how how our team um, develop their their skills and confidence. Um, and I think put their hands up to to do um, events um, like this. Um, so yeah, well done, um, Jos, on your your first um, presentation today. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Not going to lie, I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, super. Um, thanks very much. And we'll um, close the um, the presentation. If you have any um, further comments, then then please um, put them in. And I really hope that you've um, enjoyed um, today and hope to see you again soon. Thanks for everyone's time. Thanks, everyone.